Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 127, The Pillars and Pitfalls of Digitizing Revisited. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Uh, we are glad to have you in. I'm glad to have you in and have you here for this Education Friday, where we're going to talk about the pillars and pitfalls of embroidery digitizing, talking a little bit about how that affects embroidery as well, and just revisiting some of the kind of basic tenets of the stuff I always teach. Uh, very recently in the last week, I've been talking to multiple new digitizers who are asking me these very basic questions about what do I think it takes to be a good digitizer? What do I think it takes to be beyond just a good functional digitizer? What do I think are the big, biggest things to avoid? What are the things that people do wrong? What are the things that hang people up and stop them? And I know I've covered these topics before. And in fact, the cool thing is, uh, I actually decided to revisit a couple of videos I did previously that weren't in the stream of the take up. So if you're binging the take up and you haven't been in the rest of my channel, you may have missed these couple of videos I did uh, in preparation for a webinar that I did, the demyst uh, demystifying next level digitizing webinar that I taught a couple of years back, uh, which is still out there available for purchase. You want to check that out on replay. But but in preparation for that, I did these two videos, the pillars of digitizing, the pitfalls of digitizing that people really kind of resonated with. And I've gotten a lot of views, more views, honestly, than most of my take up episodes. And it's something that I've had people ask me questions about multiple times uh, in the past and recently kind of coming back up, uh, giving more voice to this concept of, hey, what is it that makes a digitizer good? What is it that makes a digitizer fall apart? And to a degree, um, how does that affect embroiderers in general, even if they're not really digitizers or not intending to digitize? What about that kind of Rent, the kind of realm of these pillars, these foundational things you need to know and need to be able to do, and the things that are commonly seen in people kind of starting out and people who are having trouble getting a hold of the digitizing embroidery. Uh, how do we avoid those? What do we do to improve ourselves in those foundational areas? Coming back up again, I thought, you know what, it's a good time to revisit it, especially with some more experience that I've had uh, in different areas of the world of embroidery and digitizing. Um, in my years at Imbrilliance, since I have been working on the back end of software, I've actually seen a lot more of the kinds of struggles people have, um, both with digitizing itself, with the concepts of digitizing and embroidery, and with their tools and how to uh, implement those tools in a way that's the most effective uh, as a digitizer, whether commercial or home or art or craft, whatever it is that you're doing. A lot of this stuff will be universal, though some of it is going to be particular to kind of my commercial milieu, where I come from, my wheelhouse. So we'll talk about some commercial stuff in there, but certainly this is applicable in my mind to all digitizers. So what we're going to do we're going to go over those existing kind of pillars and pitfalls, and then I'm going to give some updated versions, some updated commentary on those, as well as discuss some new kinds of pillars and new pitfalls that I have seen crop up in my last couple of years of dealing with just tons, hundreds of new digitizers who are coming up and trying to learn the craft. So with that, like I said, got some folks here. We're going to say hi to the people who are here. If you are here live, I would love to hear about the things you find to be foundational in digitizing, what makes a difference to your work, and the pitfalls that you fell in when you first started. Same thing with embroideries. I would love to hear what it is that made your work easier, that made you have that foundation you need to get things done, to make things successful, to get good outcomes or the things that you had trouble with that you fell into that slowed you up, that slowed down your progress. I'd love to hear from you too, but let's say hi to a few of those folks before we kind of get into the show itself. This will mostly be me talking, not a lot of example images and stuff today. So very podcastable. If you're the kind of folks who want to go listen and work, by all means, get those needles moving up and down and just listen in as you can. So let's say hi to the folks who are here. First, we have Pam Green saying hello. Pam, coming in early. Thank you for showing up, Pam. Love to have you here and always love to hear from you folks. Uh, Jeff Fuller of Fuller Embroidery Works, always doing great work and learning all sorts of things and teaching all sorts of things himself. And Adam here as well from bjhats.com. Got Mashid in saying good afternoon. Good afternoon. Glad to see you here. Frank Dunn coming in from the UK. Frank, happy to have you here as well. Uh, Curtis coming in. <laughs> didn't see earlier today. Oh, too bad, sir. I'm sorry he didn't make it before. But hey, Cindy King is in from Texas. Good afternoon. And we have Joanne saying happy Friday. Happy Friday, Joanne. Glad to have you guys all in. Like I said, as we go through the show, feel free to comment. Feel free to chime in with your own feelings about this. Uh, this is something that I think is a good open discussion we can all have. What makes us successful as digitizers? What stands out? What is difficult for us? What were the pitfalls? Like as it goes, right? So, and Melanie is in saying, hey, 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 Melanie, happy to have you in as well. Uh, and let's just get into it. Right. Let's get into it. I want to say hi to everybody. As you guys come in, I'll try and say hi to some more folks. Certainly come in with your commentaries. 
What do you think is foundational information for a digitizer or embroiderer to have? What's important? And where do you think a lot of digitizers and embroiderers fall off, fall into traps that keep them from progressing? Feel free to share. Like I said, sharing is how we all learn more. By discussion, we can arrive at greater truths than we arrive at by ourselves. Certainly, we need to cloister up sometimes and think to ourselves, but absolutely, I think by discussion, we arrive at more truths. And we also have everyone's varying opinions and points of view coming together to make something greater as a whole. But with that, we're gonna go ahead and start. First of all, I'm just gonna show you very briefly, we do have a links list. So there is the links list. All that's gonna be on there is mostly the videos that we are discussing. I'm gonna go ahead and throw up also a QR code. You can see it up here in the corner. That QR code will take you directly to the links list and let you see the videos that we're discussing. I'll very briefly just pop that up on screen. All that's on here today, if you wanna go and check out those two videos, like I said, these videos are not part of the take up stream. They're on my channel, they're a couple years old, but a lot of that's evergreen. We're gonna talk about it today, but if you wanna see the videos themselves in longer format uh, for each kind of segment, Pillars of Digitizing is there, pitfalls of digitizing is there and we also have one other episode that i'm going to be getting into soon there may be some <laughs> there may be a guest spot me going on somebody else's podcast about this but top tips for beginning a machine embroidery business stuff for embroiderers that you might want to see and just to kind of show you how long it's been since i've been doing this this is back in the first days where i had uh my old background that was taken on the show floor from uh, the, the wonderful ZSK booth. This is back in the day before I had it going and my delivery is a lot different. <laughs> so if it seems a little slower and more sedate, uh, this is what a few reps being out there in front of people every week will do for you. <laughs> you will get a little bit more comfortable in front of the camera even than I was when I started all this stuff. But yeah, check that out, the links list, uh, QR code, as you can see up there, and you'll be able to catch those two videos if you are on the video stream, you can grab that there, or it is also in the links on the screen if you need it. But yeah, good stuff there. There are some interesting points to be made, and I'm gonna kind of encapsulate those as we go today. You want the longer versions, check them out there. You'll be able to get a little bit more out of them. All right, so let's kind of start into this. Um, just want to make sure we kind of get this concept ahead of us. First thing is, you'll find other articles from me called Pitfalls and Pillars. This is just a, a scheme that I use quite a lot. Uh, pillars being foundational knowledge for whatever it is. I've done this for e-commerce. I've done this for decoration. I've done this for online sales. There's there's different stuff that I've done this kind of topic set up for. So I apologize for using these all the time. This time I even had icons for those old episodes. So I, I got a little bit too much into it and decided, you know, pillars and pitfalls are a thing. So we will be covering the pillars and the pitfalls. We have them either up here in the logos or I did even worse, just like we had my earlier, my fun little versus images. Uh, we're gonna deal with pillars, the foundational stuff and the pitfalls and uh, a little early for Halloween, but look, I can wear my mask early. All right, <laughs> so pillars and pitfalls. We're gonna talk about the things that trip us up and the things that actually get things correct, right? And actually, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and uh, grab a couple comments before we go too far, because we have a couple good ones here. So we have some nice stuff going on here. First thing, uh, Marta says, looking forward to today's episode. Thank you, Marta, for being in here. Uh, and we have uh, Pam says, did digitizing years ago, found it was hard to learn, now I'm retired, I wanna start again. Easy ways to get started. Uh, absolutely easy ways to get started are looking at videos that walk you through it. YouTube does have a lot here and it really depends. We talk about this in some of my earlier episodes, go back through the take up and look for um, methods for learning embroidery digitizing that will be in the feed. I don't have the, the uh, actual number of the episode right here in front of me. But for me, the stuff that made the difference for me were watching good designs run. So being aware of good designs running uh, and how they run, how they're put together. So watch good designs run both in software replay and on the machine. Watch those trusted designs, ones that you love, ones that you know work well. Get used to analysis and measurement. So know how to analyze what a stitch type is, what the densities are, things like that, even from pieces that are not in the original working format where you can just look up the settings, look that stuff up for sure. Uh, go to, and I would say also, not only doing analysis and watching things run, check out the materials from your digitizing software provider that will teach you how to use the basic tools because software operation does come into it, though I think that knowledge of embroidery is more important or at least needs to be there concurrently with knowledge of operation. We'll talk about that in a minute. And that's, I think, where we go to get started. Plus, 
do small test designs. Uh, earlier on, I, I did a show entirely about doing what I call drill designs or drill tests. And that is where we just put together a couple different elements of different stitch types and watch how they react with each other so we can understand how materials go together. So simple drill design, self-directed projects for yourself and test, 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 run, 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 get in those stitches. Don't avoid the trials. And I'm going to talk about that again in a minute. That's the way to get started for real. But there's more materials. Hey, if nothing else, you know, there is over 130 odd hours of me talking about this stuff. And many of them are about how to learn digitizing. Feel, please feel free to search on my channel. And honestly, there's a bunch of other channels that people have. And actually, we have Brian B B Bailey here, the creator of Imbrilliance. And he's got a good one here as he's considered a pillar. Um, Social groups that offer good advice when you're having trouble to design. I know we have those for Imbrilliance and uh, many other uh, groups have them as well. I haven't seen many as good as ours, but hey, lots of groups who are there together. Uh, the Embroidery Nerd guys have a great multidisciplinary group that does stuff too. Uh, but yeah, having a social group that has trusted people who give you advice, the only thing I'll, I'll warn you about is that people have many ways to do things. Doesn't mean they're necessarily wrong. Uh, just because somebody is uh, disagreeing with somebody else and you can pick favorites, there's usually more than one way to get something done. When you see people who have some actual kind of social proof, people trust them, they're experts in the in the field, and you can tell that that's the case, and they can show you samples of what's going on. That's a, a better trustable source. So it's not everybody who's social, but certainly uh, community support is a huge thing. Official support's great through your software provider. Official support's great through your machine manufacturer, through the people who make your materials. All of those places have great information as well. But when you're just getting started digitizing, you also want to have people around you who have done the work so they can kind of help you because a good part of it is not in the tools. It's in the interpretation, something we're going to talk about today. Uh, artistic interpretation and just literally functional interpretation. What stitches do I use and how do I draw a shape on this art that makes sense for embroidery? People who've done it before are going to be able to give you multiple answers. And though many of them may be correct because there's a lot of subjectivity in it, having the people there to help you when you get stuck is a fantastic thing to have. And I know having been someone who taught myself kind of uh, in a back room without any assistance, uh, it would have been wonderful to have what we have now. <laughs> YouTube wasn't there when I learned and certainly there was no social groups to be done. Uh, eventually we got email lists, eventually we got more, but it was a while after I got started when that happened. So like I said, we've got more people coming in, but yeah, love to go ahead and grab these comments. Uh, just gonna grab the last few before we get rolling. Anointed Song is here. Hello, everybody. Happy to have you in. Joanne says, I only do the similar digitizing myself. I love passing on my plan and vision for design collection to a professional. Yeah, you can always hire somebody out. That's not a problem. And remember that even if you're learning to digitize yourself, outsourcing as part of the mix, outsourcing, then analyzing their designs as they come in, especially if they run well, watching them run the machine. And yes, I do mean watching, keeping your eyes on it and then making that stuff run. That can help you a great deal with understanding how things are put together. Take good notes, pay close attention. You can outsource and still learn to digitize. And ultimately, embroiderers do not have to digitize to be great uh, embroiderers. But I do think it is great for most embroiderers to have digitizing software, even if they aren't going to do a lot of work for themselves. Just how I feel about it. So yeah, it is kind of how it is. Uh, Mark says, greetings, new to been using YouTube University for my education, truly enjoying digitizing, do my own for testing person projects, hiring it out for customer projects. That is a really normal way to do this. And people don't feel that way. And it may be one of the mistakes I should point out. One of the pitfalls is something that isn't on my list today, um, not accepting help and not outsourcing when it makes sense. You can absolutely outsource while you're learning and then change the mixture of how much work you do in-house to how much you outsource as you become more capable and more confident. Um, I did, now I did it very quickly. It was within the, within the span of weeks that I really took over all of the digitizing at the shop that I was at. Um, within three months, I was doing everything that there was. Within a few weeks, I was doing most of the work, but that is an abnormal amount of time for that to take. Uh, I'm just gonna be honest and say that I did kind of crazy hours that aren't normal for everybody, but you can absolutely change that mix as you go. And that is something that I t have taught forever. Bring in, work from people that you trust, analyze it, use that work for customers, make it part of your education and continually ramp up how much you do in-house even when you do the move to in-house work. So completely, completely true. All right, so we're gonna talk about some more foundations and pitfalls, but we do have comments. I will get to those for right now. Let's jump into kind of the planned pillars and pitfalls. So like I said, pillars and pitfalls, what does that mean? We are talking about the foundational things we need to know and be able to do. 
both for good embroidery digitizing and then great embroidery digitizing i'll make a difference there and then pitfalls the things we want to avoid the troubles that people fall into and like i said i'll talk about the original ones i had and then i'll talk about some updated versions of things that i think i've seen a lot that i think are poignant that we can discuss and kind of uh, get our minds around why they cause us trouble right why they cause us trouble and why some of these pillars have made people uh, better at their work so when i talk about the pillars and pitfalls really the pillars it's foundational knowledge and skills so the pillars of digitizing are the it's the foundation on which it stands on it what it's what keeps the roof over our head uh, these are foundational elements of the knowledge we need and the skills we need to have in order to digitize well and in discussing these pillars a lot of these are things you've heard me talk about before the kinds of foundational knowledge need for digitizing the ways in which we learn i also talk about kind of the priority of these types of knowledge but it expands a little bit beyond it the thing is these are mostly evergreen these are things that are always going to be the case no matter what how the tools change in general no matter how uh, technologies change some of this stuff has not changed at all so some of it you're not going to see a lot of updates on but the primary thing i think that causes the most problems for people especially if they come from different disciplines is an understanding of materials and equipment i think this is basic and most foundational it's why i kind of tend to uh, like to see people do operation for themselves they need to run and test for themselves sometimes before they digitize is better uh, i think you can learn it all at the same time but when you're learning all at the same time you will absolutely need to acquire this knowledge you have to understand how materials work but this is what it really means when i say you need to know materials and equipment uh, for materials this is the core of it and so i'm going to define it a little tighter than maybe i did in that first video back in the day and that's material behavior and interaction what do I mean by that? Whether we're talking about the garment itself, the, the material, the fabric of which a garment is made, or we're talking about the stabilizer that we're putting with it or the topper that we might be putting on top of it, we want to know how it behaves, uh, how it stretches, how it's affected by being under tension with stitches, how, it's, how the stitches themselves interact with it. And when I talk about material in this case, I'm also talking about our threads. So whether we're running rayon, or polyester, which is very common these days to be the top kind of choice, or we're running something a little more outlandish. More and more these days, I'm seeing people who are running, strangely enough, uh, stuff like organic cotton because they're trying to do things that are a little more eco-friendly. They're not into microplastics, stuff like that. There are more people who are choosing to run uh, threads that are a little different than what we might have seen when I first started embroidering commercially. So you need to understand the behaviors of these different materials. So mater those materials and then how they interact with each other, understanding how materials work, understanding honestly how the forces of embroidery act on garments and act on stabilizers when they're working all together, when everything's under tension, working well, when we've hooped correctly, when we're using all the materials right, and also what materials need to be used with whatever garment combinations and embroidery combinations we're putting together. I think this is important to know. Yes, we have things like, I mean, and Brilliance has a project advisor in it that tells you some of this stuff and helps. Uh, certainly you can look at your material manufacturers. You can look at, uh, sometimes even the garment companies will have direction or will have some sort of attention to uh, decoration styles and tell you things like uh, embroiderable areas and how to handle things and what they recommend. But all in all, you need to be able to understand directly through, and I think through firsthand experience as best as you can, how materials interact. So material behavior and interaction, what happens literally to the kind of fabrics that I'm going to run on when I embroider on them? What's going to happen when I start to embroider and different styles of designs, this is all part of it, with my different threads on materials. The thing is, this is generally something that we can learn both from you know, documentation, the stuff that I told you earlier, people telling you these things from communities kind of helping you out, though there's some difficulty with that because of what I'm going to talk about as a pitfall, which is kind of like magical thinking where people just throw things together or just constantly stack on more and more materials until something works. Um, it's unsent unscientific testing. But if we can learn from those community sources, certainly we learn from documentation, certainly we can learn from reading up from our suppliers. But I think that down to the wire, what's really going to make the difference, if we want to make this foundational, we just need to run stuff. Get designs that you know are meant to run in a certain place or in a certain way on a certain piece of material, run them, run them on a couple different kinds of materials and see what the changes are, analyze how they work. If you're going to run something also, I, 
if you're going to run anything new, any new material, the best thing you can do for yourself is to secure an additional amount of material, to secure an additional amount more than any project that you need of any of the supplies that you're using, put them together, run them with a known design so you know what it's supposed to turn out like, you understand how it's supposed to work, and observe how it interacts. Observation is key. So one of the things that is a kind of a new pillar is understanding analysis. Though I've talked about it many times, I never put it in the category of a pillar, but that's the thing. Being able to have clear observation, watching carefully, taking notes, and developing that sense for understanding these things and understanding how they come together. And if nothing else, just being able to pay close attention and take good notes as to what's going on on the machine, as to what's going on with the materials is critical. We'll talk about that more as we go. We have material behavior interaction. That's the materials part of materials and equipment. The other part is equipment functionality and operation. When I usually talk about equipment, um, I used to just be talking about how embroidery machines work in general and things like on your particular embroidery machine, what's going to happen with a, when you get to a certain length? Maybe you get over that 12.4 millimeter line and you find that it starts reacting differently. And depending on the machine you have, certain machines have different limitations for things like uh, the hoops that they can address, things like that. The embroiderable area on different machines is different. Um, that's part of it. Also understanding things like what in file formats, because it's partially software, partially equipment, what Dent tends to fire off your trimmers. What, are, what tends to be the way a jump is handled? How do color formats work? Uh, how do frame outs work? And what can you do to make that happen? But also just in general, how does your equipment work and how can you adjust it? Equipment functionality. Um, used to be just stuff about the equipment directly like that. But in this case, uh, the other part of it is that equipment now is a combination of equipment and onboard software and all this other stuff that can happen. You need to understand the entire chain of what things change and what can change on your machine as you load things up. Not all machines have it. Some machines have things like onboard stitch filtering. It's a thing that when I first started did not exist, uh, where it can do things like alter your design and take out either overly long or overly short stitches. If your machine does that, you can have problems as a digitizer if you don't know that if you feed it stitches that it's going to filter out, you don't know that a filter is being applied on the machine itself, you can end up with a result that isn't what you expect from doing what I call your, your pre-flight, which is looking at your final output file and seeing what has happened through all the processes of using your software. So equipment functionality for me used to be, hey, understand a color change, understand a trim, know what's going to stop on the machine. Also know what settings on the machine, like how many jumps fires off of trim in a DST file, or uh, does the machine stop if you have the same color assigned back to back? These things are settings you might have to set or that are specific to a certain kind of work. Applique work is a big one for this. Applique work or in the hoop work, anytime where you're going to have to uh, stop something on purpose or do a frame out, there are settings on your machine that you may have to have specifically set to allow it to stop when it should or to do what it should. And there are things like manual frame outs that you could do when you stop something manually if you choose to only do that as a manual action instead of having it set up as an automatic action. You have to understand how your individual machine will work. And if you're someone who's digitizing for other people, you will have to discuss with them how their machine works if they have any of these kinds of problems. Most stuff can be done within a safe range of settings that works for everybody, but it may not work for every single machine. And you may find that those limitations are important, especially if they are some of the kind of more, I won't say outlandish, but some of the more restrictive uh, kinds of functionality. Uh, one of the ones I know for sure is, are there are some prosumer level machines that have a very distinct vertical limit on hats that is smaller than you might see even out of a recommendation for a commercial machine where a commercial machine doesn't really have a limit. It just is unadvisable to go over a certain vertical limit. Certainly it doesn't have the kind of limits at least that we're talking about. Whereas some of the prosumer machines will have a very distinct limit. Um, it's something you have to know in order to get things to work. So both knowing the normal functionality of every embroidery machine, which is what I used to mean. And now knowing the kinds of software onboard things that can happen and the kinds of actual limitations and or uh, other settings that can change the way your file works on your machine are both critical to being a good digitizer. You kind of have to understand that. All digitizers should know how the general embroidery machine functions and how it forms stitches and what that changes about the choices we make. But individual digitizers for themselves or for particular markets are also going to have to be able to cope with the kinds of changes that can happen in machines and the troubleshooting that happens as well. So equipment functionality and operation is there. 
The most important thing to me, however, is, and this is what I used to call it. I used to call this uh, embroidery and digitizing knowledge, and I actually put terms over there in parentheses. And this is what I consider to be kind of the kernel of what digitizers need to know for foundational information. Uh, but this is kind of how I'm thinking about it now. We're talking about embroidery and digitizing and the knowledge that we have to know for it. Instead of just considering it terms or just talking about that as a, a kind of amorphous thing, I'm going to call it terms and truths. You have to know the terminology of digitizing and you have to understand things like the measurements that are present, uh, things like how density functions and how you describe it, stitch types, underlay styles, things that allow you to communicate with other people and also understand how people who are trying to teach you are explaining things to you. Those are terms and truths you need to understand, certainly, but that's the term side of it. That's the terminology and the jargon side of it. The truths to me are, it really can be boiled down this way. The truths of embroidery are understanding stitches. So what they are, what a certain stitch type, we all know there's only one stitch in embroidery. It's a, a single line from point to point, but the way we stack those together and orient them in relationship to each other makes what we consider stitch types. But we talk about stitches and the way they work. So how they actually function, what do they do to a garment? What do they do in relationship to each other? I have a, done a, a recent episode on interactions, stitch type interactions, which is worth checking out, um, but stitches in the way they work. So what are stitches and how do they work with each other on garments, on textures, with different materials, with different colors? How do stitches work together and with our garment? What do they do? And this is one big portion of it. This is one of the big truths. How do stitches work? It's also about the material interactions and everything else, but how are stitches put together? And certainly as digitizers, how do digitizing decisions, decisions we make, settings that we set, shapes that we draw, the decisions we make when we analyze a piece of art and break it up into the shapes that we need for embroidery, how do those affect embroidery outcomes? When we make a tweak in our software, what will happen when it gets to the other end of the machine? This is, once again, we can learn this through education directly. You can learn learn it from somebody like me telling you. You can learn it from the manuals. You can learn it from all of those things. But experience is going to reinforce this tremendously. This is where we run designs, watch them run on screen, watch them run on machines, on the intended materials, and make comparisons between these different things to understand what changes have happened between our file and the final outcome, and the kinds of interactions that are happening between the material, the thread, the needle, and the stabilizer all happening live. This is going to tell us the most that we can. Running designs is imperative. However, this is what we really need to know. So when we talk about embroidery and digitizing knowledge, that's an easy way to say it. But what we're really saying is terms and truth. We have to be able to define and discuss embroidery and digitizing and how it works. So, but we need to know stitches, the types of stitches that we have available, the kinds of, of ways we put them together and the way they work. And then we have to understand how digitizing decisions also means how digitizing settings, how different parameters, you can call it whatever you want to under that umbrella of digitizing decisions, because it is both the way we draw, the sequence in which we put our design elements, the direction we travel from design element to design element, what all those decisions affect in the final embroidery. When we change one thing here, <laughs> I'll go backward to you guys since I, left to right will be right to left because we have the flipped camera. What a change we make here will affect here in our outcome. If we start here and we make a change, what's going to happen here in our outcome? And as we start to understand more and more of these digitizing decisions and how we define these terms, some of the definitions are going to lead us to understand more about what's gonna happen over here. But testing and seeing good designs run, uh, operation, will teach us the most, will bring us an understanding of how those decisions affect the outcome. That's the most critical part. If I could choose one thing you need to focus on, it's this. Terms and truths, stitches the way they work, how our decisions affect our outcomes. And a lot of that is done by pushing the buttons. First, under getting some understanding under our belt to understand why we push the buttons, certainly, absolutely. But then drawing some shapes, putting them together, assigning some stitch types and some settings, running them out and finding out what the outcome is. Yes, we should learn from instructional, project-based, educational videos and materials that will teach us how to make specific things. But unless we are watching those projects with an eye toward this, you may not understand. 
following a recipe to the T is a lot different than understanding how leavening works in your bread, right? If you understand how the materials are put together, you can make changes that someone did not expressly tell you to make and get real results because we understand the how. We know how stitches work. We know material behavior and interactions. And I think that is just super clear, right? Super clear. And so I have a couple of comments here that I am definitely going to bring in here. I think it's worthwhile to say, to bring these in. Uh, certainly stuff that we have to look at, we have to understand operations, stuff like that. But the thing is, it really depends on how you put things together, which one you go for first. I just think those are the most important of the kind of things we have to understand, right? I'm going to go further than that in just a moment. But this one, I like this. Cindy says, for her, most important is the foundation or underlay that the embroidery stitches on. Yes, uh, underlay is foundational constructive stitching. It's not just something that's under something else. There is such a thing as travel stitching where we travel under an element and we're just trying to get from point A to point B. But real underlay is constructive. It serves the purpose of um, affixing the material to the stabilizer, lifting up the stitches that are on top of it and providing color coverage. It has a function. If we understand how adding more or removing underlay, moving our insets away from the top stitching, from the edge of the top stitching, whether we move it in or move it out, how that affects the edge quality of the top stitching we're working on, testing on those kinds of settings is going to teach us a lot absolutely will help everything. And a couple other things that I have to say here. Uh, Lisa says, good afternoon. Sounds like you're bursting the one size fits all myth again. Yeah. Truth of the matter is there is no uh, one size fits all way of learning. There's not a one size fits all set of settings that we can use. And that's by its very nature. Uh, embroidery differs with the materials that we use and with the embroidery, um, the embroidery target, right? With the ground that we're stitching onto, with the substrate that we're stitching onto. So it makes sense that we understand a little bit more about how all of, the, all of these things hold up to embroidery. That's our material interactions, right? So that's how I feel about that. And I'm gonna go, I don't know who the Facebook user is here. I, if I missed who you are, I apologize. But yeah, if you're logged in in a certain way, sometimes we can't see your name, but this is true also. And this is a pitfall. I'm gonna go ahead and kind of give you a preview on. Uh, she says, uh, it's so important to have maintenance done in your machines. This is a big pitfall I see with people starting out in embroidery. I understand that embroidery is very expensive. I will say this, if you are buying a used machine, make sure it is serviced and working accurately because if you are starting to learn to digitize at the same time you're learning embroidery and you buy yourself a used machine that may or may not be working at the best kind of way that it could be, you might be fighting the function of the machine and not your skills, not your understanding, not your materials or your techniques. You can be fighting with a machine that's not working well. Especially when we're talking about things like tension and looping and stuff like that absolutely uh, can make a big difference to your finish quality. And I have seen machines and have run machines that were running so poorly or had the belts or, or other drive elements working so poorly that I was getting things like percentage of difference between the X axis and Y axis and how much it was moving. And of course, that was causing distortion overall through the entirety of my designs. If I adjusted all of my designs to work on those machines, which I often had to, they would then not work on a machine that was in good repair. So understanding what's happening on the machine, how the machine moves the pantograph, which is the, the piece that moves our hoops around. We all know the hoops move, not the needles. What that is doing in accordance to what we do in our digitizing, how we instruct the software to place stitches the way we want them to be. Yes, there's automation involved, but it's still following our instructions. That is a key part of knowing what's going on. So that's part of that, that equipment stuff, right? That's how it goes. That's how it goes. And let's go ahead with Joanne. I agree with this as far as uh, underlay goes. I've seen the most amazing, seemingly densely in designs use underlay to create coverage without bulk on the final design. Remember that some of the bulk that happens is when too many stitch penetrations are all in the same place. This is where we're getting on bulk is three-dimensional bulk. All these little threads being stuck through our fully filled piece of material. And sometimes we can have multiple layers of stuff and we can have underlay un under our stuff on top, but the penetrations aren't there. So we don't get warping and three-dimensional problems because we're just laying thread over the top and we don't have too many penetration points. It's also why it's great to put a satin stitch text right over top of a fill most of the time. If we don't have it super dense or too much underlay on the satin stitch text or on the fill itself, you can run a layer of satin stitch right on top of a layer of fill and you're not gonna see a lot of trouble. We're not seeing a bunch of those penetration points all lined up. But when you put too much detail in one very small spot, try and draw really tiny engraving style details, let's say on a face in the middle of a seal, you're going to see that pucker and ripple and punch through the back and cause thread breaks. 
because we have to remember three-dimensional density, not just two-dimensional density. People think about laying things on top of each other, stacking, and they get worried about that. But And that does cause some heaviness in bulk. But the thing that causes all the 3D warping and trouble is all of the penetration points in the same areas. Those cause the worst. Absolutely true. Uh, last couple of things here. Ramona said, my first machine was a used brother six needle. Didn't even take it home first. Took it straight to the service tech. It was an expected budget consideration. Absolutely. Pam says, knowing what, why I am doing something helps me understand the process. Absolutely. Knowing the why is what we're after in the end because it also helps us do new things. We want to go beyond good digitizing to great digitizing. Understanding why we did the thing we're doing and what the effects are will allow us to make educated guesses to how a different change or a new type of execution or interpretation will result in a different kind of outcome that we're trying to get. If we're trying to do something that no one has taught us before, understanding how things work and why we're doing them is the best way we have to innovate to make something new. And totally agree with Gene on this one. Even something as simple as a new bobbin case can help a used machine. I cannot tell you how many times somebody has been having tension problems. They've been having looping or something else going wrong. And what they have is either a dirty bobbin spring, which is very easy to deal with. Get yourself a business card and clean under that spring. They're losing tension in, in that spring because there's junk built up underneath it. Or somebody's having intermittent problems with their stitching and you find out that they have dropped their bobbin case on concrete. It's out of round if they're using old school, especially old school paper sided bobbins, which a lot of us still do, um, then you'll find that that paper bobbin is occasionally finding a way to get erratic and touch the side of the bobbin case. And it's actually increasing the tension down and causing issues with bird nesting and looping on the bottom sometimes. Um, it's bizarre how that can happen. But yeah, lots of problems with tension start at the bobbin because the bobbin is common to all needles, common to all setups. Check that bobbin and make sure everything's right. And yeah, on a used machine, honestly, you buy a used machine, it is a good concept to just buy a brand new bobbin case for it right out of the gate. Um, and we're not talking, of course, about home style machines or single million machines, but if you're talking about a commercial style machine or any other sort of, uh, I guess I will call them an upright style machine, a prosumer machine, a commercial machine, something that looks like what's in my green screen background behind me, uh, a new bobbin case on a used machine is a pretty good bet. <laughs> That's a pretty good bet. Also needle plate, because sometimes you'll find thread breaking issues and it's entirely because we've got a scored needle plate. We've broken a needle, we've hit it somehow. There's a scratch on it. So also the hook can be that way too. You'll have a scratch on the hook and it'll cause fraying or breakage. Get Even if you have a used machine, get your thread path clean, look for scoring or sc scratches or gouges, replace your, your uh, bobbin case. That can all help. But you know what helps a great deal too? I hate to say it is getting a machine that hasn't been through a lot of abuse. Um, used machines are a great way to start. I love people to be able to use them and putting them out to pasture too early never sits right with me, but it can sometimes make things harder if you have no other benchmark on which to co compare, right? That that can cause trouble for you. All right, let's go through kind of the rest of the pillars. We'll get to the, the pitfalls and kind of do some updates. So we talked about the different things we need, right? And, and the last thing of those basic pillars is software operation. And then I will say this, I used to think of software operation almost as an afterthought. These days, I, I kind of bring it up a little higher in the stack than I used to. By all means, uh, the materials, understanding embroidery and digitizing itself, so stitches in the way things work, they work, how digitizing decisions affect outcomes, still the most important thing because those are applicable no matter what tool you're using across any stitch, uh, any sort of stitch type, any sort of tool, any drawing tool, any software. However, I will say this, software operation, I have seen so many people now, If we, I will consider this part of a pitfall, so many people who have expectations about their software that really don't line up with how either any software works or how their particular software works. And rather than understand how the tools that are in front of them work, they will run with some expectations. I'm gonna talk about in the pitfall section. Uh, so one of the pillars is certainly software operation. Whatever software you have, learn the tools that are in your software and learn them well. Part of this is not just go through the manual and read it like, you know, you know, from page to page without before touching anything, no. But get out there and avail yourself both of the manuals and the official documentation, the official YouTubes and of the community that's out there and learn how to operate your software. Also push buttons, especially when we haven't even gotten to the machine. The chances of you messing something up beyond all sorts, all ability to fix it are very rare. You're not going to do that. Plus save versions of files off and then try stuff. Um, the ultimate thing is if you start to understand individual stitches and how they operate, the other thing I'm going to tell you, and this is something that might sound a little funny, I'm putting it in the pitfall section later, how you get those stitches you need 
is kind of immaterial. If we think about a DST file, kind of the stock, and it's an old school file. We now have better files, or at least newer files that have uh, more instructions in them that have color savings uh, on each color stop. So you can see these on, on the new monitor setups that we have on almost all machines these days. Yes, but if we think about the original DST, which still runs on just about every machine, what it really encodes in it, I mean, there, there's more to it than this, but what it really encodes in it are needle positions, whether the needle's up or down. That's mostly what there is. It drops needle points. No matter what tools we use on the front end, what we're eventually generating are places where we drop our needle. And the thing is, you can use tools in your software to do more than you think. And just because something's named a certain way or has a certain type of you know, tool set doesn't mean you have to use it exactly in that way. If it provides you with stitches that do what you want, by the time it's on the machine, fair play. <laughs> that is fair play. Any way we get to stitches that we understand will make what we want on the machine and run correctly is fair game. So software operation is not just about the basic parts, which we all should understand, which is we know how to need to know how to draw shapes. We need to understand how to set those parameters, how to make those decisions about stitch type and density and underlay and inset and stitch length and patterns. We need to be able to set all that stuff. That's basic operation. We also need to understand the basic operation of getting our file to the machine. How do we output what formats should be there and how do those formats, how do we control those formats? That is all very important. The other part of software operation is understanding each tool well enough to know that you can use the tools differently than you might expect and that we can put different tools together to make things happen in different ways. And something I'm gonna talk about in the pitfalls in a moment, but software operation is number one, being able to draw what you intend to and apply stitches to those drawn shapes. That is super, super, super important. That is digitizing. It is the key to all digitizing. However, the secondary part that people sometimes forget is all of the file processing. We need to understand how to operate our software in such a way that we set up our filters, we set up our file types correctly, and we can output a file that is useful to our machine that works in the way we intend it to. You have to understand everything your software is doing between the digitizing state and the file export state to get that correctly. There is a lot of filtering that can happen depending on what's turned on and what's turned off, and it may be different by default in different softwares. We need to understand that to get full control of our file that we're eventually sending to the machine. So that's important. That's another part of software operation. And the last little part that goes into the from good to great section of the pillars is that software operation includes learning how to use the tools in ways that are sometimes maybe, if not off book, are not directly spelled out. For instance, having an automatic underlay tool or an automatic uh, applique tool, let me kind of say that out loud. Let me change that up. This is what I actually want to talk about. Having an automatic applique tool doesn't mean we can't build an applique with straight stitches or satin stitches. We can build our own applique cover stitching in place and stitching if we want to. Automation gives us a lot of options. Also, how about this? We have an automatic underlay tool that can do it all in one step. It doesn't mean we can't use multiple copies of the same underlay shape and only run each step at a time so that things run in the sequence we want. The tools don't necessarily define the use entirely. They give us a plethora of options for use and it's up to us to understand how we want to use those to make the, those decisions we want to make, the creative decisions. So I'm going to talk about that again very briefly in the pitfalls section, uh, that when we get to a point where we forget that we have the creative agency in this thing, we can sometimes kind of get ahead of ourselves or just forget ourselves and think, okay, we're waiting for a solution to come to us when the solutions are in front of us or when we can push beyond it. Like I said, the applique tool. I saw recently uh, Lisa was sharing something very cool where she's doing applique that has decorative stitching, stitching on top of the traditional applique edge. That is something that you add yourself and there is nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that there's something missing from an applique tool. It means that we can add other decorative elements using the tool set that we have. And that's very normal. Um, it's, it's cool that we have automation and some of the automation we have now has changed me from saying that all automation is difficult to saying um, automation that takes away creative impetus might be a problem, but automation that allows us to do things beyond what we could do uh, with our time or with our efforts otherwise is, is fantastic, especially some of the creative automation I've seen in recent years, and especially how it enables people who aren't going to do all of the fiddling around the digitizers just do to make better things for themselves. But forgetting that that automation is still under our control and can still be, and that it is expected that we may push things 
di to a different place or that we may change the operation somewhat to make sense for our project. We still have to be present in this, but that's part of learning operation. And in fact, that kind of leads into what I consider from good to great. All of the stuff we just said are the base levels of how we're going to be good as digitizers where we make functional files that everybody can use and that we are happy with for ourselves. But as we go through this good to great, I'm going to update these a little bit too. But here's here are the ways that I think we can go from good to great. What makes a good digitizer uh, versus what makes a great digitizer, right? Here's the difference. Number one, an eye toward production efficiency. Now, I think even in people who are doing creative work for themselves, production efficiency is something to look for. Um, but I'm going to kind of go beyond that. And we'll talk about that in a minute when we talk about the pitfalls. Um, production efficiency for me means that uh, a couple different things, because we're going to talk about stitch consciousness in a minute, and we'll talk about what I mean by that. But Production efficiency for me is uh, not stopping too many times for multiple color changes, not doing bunches of jumps and trims where they don't make sense. If you need to do a jump and a trim for the aesthetics of a thing where you don't want any sort of connecting stitches, absolutely, that's a creative choice, not a technical choice. But understanding how to make things move efficiently, believe it or not, it goes hand in hand with the technical ability to make things line up on screen, to get register registration between fills and borders. The efficiency of movement in a design also lends itself to that. We make deviations from efficient movement in a design in order to suit things like technical difficulties, like uh, working on large pieces where we may have to move too far from color to color. and We might have to uh, isolate one area, one quadrant at a time to work on to get them to sell right, to get the outlines to line up. Those should be deviations, whereas most of the time we want to go efficiently. We want to use every color once when it's possible, uh, the least number of times when we have to layer things differently for artistic uh, considerations or for technical considerations. Um, but production efficiency is something that makes you great. Why? Uh, if you ever have anyone else operate with your file beyond you, they will love you for it because you're not going to make them do excessive uh, color changes. Hey, even on the single needle machines, what would people love to do is not have to switch out the thread too much. So even we're talking about the home world. I mean, I'm coming from the commercial world where it's about lost time and increased runtime in your given day, right? Or decreased running time, so increased number of runs that you can achieve in a particular day, or a decreased number of trims and thread pullouts, you know, things like that. That's where I come from. But even if you're doing it in a creative way, production efficiency makes your designs run better and gives you a better feeling toward it. And if you're somebody doing this for yourself, production efficiency in your digitizing means you just spend less time on the machine waiting. Less time waiting for things to get done, and also you have less chance of spoilage. So production efficiency is all about that. The next thing is stitch quality. We should be having stitch quality in our minds, and I mean like quality of edges, quality of coverage, things like that. That should be in our minds as part of the basic work, but when you're someone who's going from good to great, what I mean is stitch quality control. You get to a point where instead of blasting everything with full coverage, you can lighten densities to make sure you're getting just the coverage you want on a particular garment and colorway so that we get nice light garments that have a nice hand or that we can work on difficult materials and still get pretty clean edges or at least understand how we can do things like bolster the clean edges, get nice coverage on garments that are difficult. That's that quality control. And it's a little bit more than just understanding how to make it work kind of with a base set of settings like a stock design might have. It's where we can adjust the quality of the stitch in specific ways, we understand what's going to happen when we make different decisions for a particular outcome, like a soft hand, like a lighter aspect, uh, like we're working on materials that won't hold up to a tremendous amount of stitching, or when we're working on materials that require extra stitching and reinforcement to make them look good. Control of stitch quality, with fine control is something that's going to be kind of a good to great move. That's what makes you great. The last thing, and I think that it's part one of the most important things, is artistic interpretation. This is something we all do as digitizers. We look at a piece of art, we say which portions of this should be which stitch type, which should go first, which should layer on top of those, and how do different decisions as far as my stitch length, my patterns, my stitch types, uh, make the design look a certain way. We wanna get a clarity so it represents the art that we're looking at, but that it does its best with the medium. And we're gonna go in beyond that with my kind of updated pillars, but this is one of the big pillars. Uh, being able to look at art in front of you, and actually I talked about this in one of our Stitch Artist groups recently. Uh, somebody said, hey, does anybody else feel like uh, Neo from the Matrix? We all know the movie from some years ago where Neo's looking at the, at the walls around him and suddenly he's aware of the code and everything works. And I told her, this is something I say in my classes all the time. 
when you start digitizing, you're looking at all these different things and it's kind of hard to interpret. You don't know what stuff is. And then eventually you get to this point where everywhere you look, when you're walking around, you develop what I call the eye for embroidery. And you're like, all right, I'm looking at this picture and I would make the carved border of the picture look like this. And I would use these colors, the stitch angles, and the picture itself would be these densities and these stitch types. And I would go in this order. And suddenly, like Neo looking out at the matrix turning into code around him, everything you look at is stitches. And that's that artistic interpretation. We all have to do a certain amount of it. Basic interpretation literally is, hey, I'm looking at these fields of color and these lines. What stitch type should I use? And what shape do I have to draw to get those stitch types to work correctly? That's the basic artistic interpretation. When we go beyond it, when we're going from good to great, it's what can we do that's unique to embroidery with texture, with the different kinds of ways embroidery and stitches work to make something more than what is present in the print. Something that plays with the light, something that plays with texture that shows some quality of surface that is unique to what we can do since we're using a three-dimensional medium in embroidery, we're using real thread, and maybe how we can use different materials, right? So those are kind of my big pillars for going from good to great. Being production efficient, minimum number of trims, minimum number of jumps, minimum number of revisitation of colors. That's a big thing for production efficiency. Fine control of stitch quality, being able to produce specific kinds of results in relation to materials that you're working on, in relation to literally kind of qualities you want out of your embroidery and achieving balances between things like coverage and density, between things like edge quality and density as well to some degree and underlay in order to make the kind of qualities you need on different materials. And then artistic interpretation, how do we interpret the images in front of us into something that makes sense for embroidery? So, but here's the thing, I have some updated pillars over the last couple of years that I think are really interesting. So this is the kind of thing I think goes even beyond and could be seen as part of what makes a great decorator these days more than it might have back in the day. Back in the day, I was really focused because everybody's very specialized in embroidery and digitizing, and that's what we were working for. And embroiderers were embroiderers, printers were printers. Yes, we did multidisciplinary stuff. Yes, people knew it. But usually when I was talking to a digitizer, this is somebody who is going to work in one medium. Maybe multimedia was a very, uh, was more of an edge case thing than it used to be. And on top of that, people were really trying to just get a hold of what digitizing was, and they weren't looking to do more than break up a logo into some shapes and make it work for thread. What we did in print, we now want to do in stitches, and I got to do that correctly. And it has to run pretty clean on a machine. That's where digitizing was as far as a lot of education when I first started. There are certainly people who are out there doing great stuff. Um, Lee Caracelli, if you've seen her, she's been talking about blending forever, but her stuff is a very different kind of animal from most corporate embroidery. So when we talked about corporate embroidery, logo embroidery, it really was just the standard. It was making things work. And it was actually kind of weird and rare when I started teaching kind of uh, next level digitizing, very much like the demystifying course that brought up all of these videos that started this thing. Um, that stuff really was a little bit different, was different. But now I think it, we've gone beyond just embroidery all the time and just stock embroidery that it does not have any sort of artistic medium-based concerns to it. So my, my three kind of outdated pillars are this, are these actually. Uh, number one, awareness of decoration options. These days, even at home, even in the smallest shop, the possibility for doing things like adding digital print, either through transfers or sublimation or some other sort of medium, even pre-ordered transfers, pre-ordered rhinestone transfers, the ability to do heat press printing, the ability to add printed materials, either direct through direct ordering through places like Spoonflower or doing your own printing at home with transfers is even more accessible. Yes, it's existed before. It's nothing new under the sun. However, the number of decoration options and multimedia options that we have in front of us are multitude. And it also means that sometimes we have to understand, especially if we're commercial decorators, that there's an option that's not straight embroidery, just straight embroidery the way we understand it, that might make more sense for the customer or for the materials we're working on. Awareness of decoration options, what's out there as far as techniques, and I would say also multimedia, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more, makes you a better embroiderer and digitizer in general, and it gives you better options. And it's not that everybody's going to skill up and equip themselves for all these different things, but knowing what's out there can help you decide whether or not it's something you want to branch into. And more and more people have it available to them and may already have equipment that allows them to do this stuff. So awareness of decoration options. We can also consider this things like awareness of options for other materials that are out there. I'm actually gonna move this into another pillar 
that I think is a little new, like I said, and this still kind of falls in that same area, uh, making the most of your machines and media. I'm seeing people start to understand that the embroidery machine can do so much more than reproduce normal embroideries. We can use it for things like patch edging. If you've seen us work on the Merrily project or Stitch Artist 3, or we do faux marrowing, have you seen, hey, Jeff, uh, who's here on the call or was here earlier, I don't know if he's still on, makes his fuller border, then you know that people are doing things like edging patches on everyday embroidery machines. And that's one of the things. You see people doing things like emulating chenille or emulating different textures that aren't standard fill textures. We are now making things that look different. Our media, our embroidery, and our machines can do a lot more than you might think. Funny enough, when we're talking to commercial people, it's the home embroiderers who've pushed their machines to do more, like in the hoop construction and things of that nature that maybe the uh, commercial writers didn't think of. But as more commercial work takes on this retail style where more people want different kinds of styles or want to do things like, funny enough, uh, visible mending or reusing garments, they're finding that they're having to do things like co cover ups and constructions and repairs more than they used to, especially at very small shops or local shops. Um, making the most of your machines and the media available, also understanding things like not just the media that's outside of embroidery, but the multitude of threads that are available now. It's not rayon versus poly. It's rayon, poly, cotton. It is matte finish. It is glow in the dark. And now the glow in the dark actually runs well. It's not like the old multi-filament glow in the dark threads that used to be there. It's the new metallic threads that are available that run cleanly. It's, you know, Bermelana wool thread, it's acrylic threads that are fuzzy. There are options beyond what we had, but they also feed into the digitizing where we need to understand how digitizers handle those. I think people are, are coming to that place. Commercial digitizers are probably the last to get there, but I think the mixture of these different mediums of people, well, honestly, that's the mediums that sell the media themselves, but the different people coming from different perspectives, the home market, the art market, the textile artists, the the commercial embroiderers are coming together to make these new mixtures. It's why I love having discussions here where we all get together from different backgrounds. Uh, I think making the most of machines and media is how you get to be great as a digitizer as well, because you have options that you might not otherwise concern yourself with if you stick with the standardization. And then the last thing is something that really is baked into all the stuff I said earlier, but it's something I want to call out as a pillar because it's something I also see people having trouble with. And this is the ability to analyze. This is the ability to look at something made of thread and understand things like stitch direction, stitch types, and density kind of at a glance. It doesn't mean it's the direct measurements. It does mean we can usually look at things. And if we are aware of how embroidery looks and acts, if we've consumed enough embroidery, we've seen enough designs run, if we've looked at enough examples of embroidery in our lives, we can look at them and have a kind of intuition about how they're put together or an idea of how we're going to replicate pieces we want or to take things from them. But I think this is so big that it's worth developing. If you have a hard time telling one kind of embroidery, one kind of stitch from another, stop and look at lots of samples, make things in your software, stitch them out, and then look at what they look like in real life so that when you encounter them out in the world, you'll say, all right, I see stitches like this and I wanna do something similar what thing that I can make on my software looks similar to this? The ability to analyze is really critical. And sometimes people fall into this magical thing, thinking where they're just going, okay, it's this kind of stitch. And if we looked carefully at the stitch lengths, the pattern that's involved, the, the kind of area that's being filled, the angles that are there, I look at these things and go, I don't know how someone doesn't understand what kind of stitch type that is. And I realize part of that is just because I've seen so much embroidery in my life, certainly. But the other thing is I think people don't cultivate that analyzing sense. They don't culti cultivate the analysis as a skill in the way that you might be able to, if you thought about this as part of one of these pillars, as something that you need to have to be the best you can be at embroidery. And certainly this is also um, analyzing a piece of art for the best way to work with it, to break it up into shapes. But that ability is pretty paramount. Developing the eye for embroidery is paramount. But I think that thinking about it in the terms of consuming enough embroidery and looking at enough pieces of work to know how thread goes together and what that means and certainly understanding how, like I said, our digitizing decisions affect the outcome is really critical and we should develop it as a skill. All right, so I'm gonna get into pitfalls. I'm gonna jump into the comments really quickly, very, very, very short because I want the pillar, the pitfalls to be kind of the shorter part of this. Only going to do a little bit on the pitfalls because I think that they're not maybe as critical as the pillars, but the pillars I think are, are important, right? I think it's something that we should look at. Uh, 
but I think they're common to everybody. A lot of it has to do with paying attention. A lot of it has to do with looking at what's going on. And uh, <laughs> certainly it has to do with understanding embroidery and thread and getting some experience. Um, I think defining it in a in a express kind of way is a way that I can kind of just bring it out and get those key points so people understand what's going on. But it is more holistic than this, and a lot of it is getting experience with embroidery, getting some reps uh, kind of under your belt, bringing in designs that work well, watching them run in software, watching them run on the machine, and making good observations. It's really what it is. Be observant. Take time to watch things run, and then when you play after you understand how like what buttons do what in your software when you play connecting that correlating that staying open and curious as to how changes in software affect what's eventually going to happen and then bringing in the material side of that to say here are all these different options and lots of that can be learned like i said i teach things on specialty threads and thick and thin threads and all that stuff all the time but if you go even to the people who sell the threads they'll often tell you things like densities they will give you free designs that are made with the material in mind that will help you understand how they work if you run them with that material and see what's going on. So I think that's that is a thing, right? That's that's what we need, that's what we have to get. We just have to bring those different kind of uh legs of the stool under ourselves so that we can set up on them, right? All those pillars have to be present for it to work out. So that's how that's how it works, right? That's the thing that we have to look at. So um, with that, we've got a couple people who's mentioned stuff. Really, it's just, like I said, less time waiting means more time creating. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Facebook user here, once again, don't know who you are. I hate to say your name, Facebook user, but here, here we have at least something that is worthwhile to say. Uh, I still run my 12, 16, Brother 12, and it runs like a kitten because I have always serviced it every two years. Yeah, I ran a Brother BAS 415 for many years, a nine needle machine. If I still had it and was still servicing it, I'd still run it now. Um, it's a known quantity though. I think the problem is when you buy a brand, like you buy a machine new to you that's used that you don't know its service record, which some people do, they buy them out of like storage units or on auction. That's where it freaks me out more. Old machines can still do great work. I've I've worked on machines that look like we're about to, you know, uh, launch one of the Apollo missions on them because they're so old and the keycaps and everything look ancient, but they still run well. An old Baradin machine we ran, ran like a tank old turret head machine it had the rotating turret head instead of the cartridge head that we know and, and love. So it changed needles by turning the head. Uh, real old machine had an old school keyboard lettering set up with the circuit boards in it. Ran like a champ, all flat, no tubular. Worked great, but it was serviced well and we knew what it could do and we knew also knew what it couldn't do. We knew how to work around it when it couldn't do something. So that's kind of how it is. No wonder from Facebook user says, uh, I scored Madeira, the only threads I put on my machines has worked for me. I've used all sorts of threads. I'm going to say this. I'm a Madeira guy primarily, have used it most of my life. I trust it very well. Have used a ton of Isocord in my time too. However, I've used all manner of threads. I've used everything from Iris or, and to be honest with you, when I needed a thread badly enough, if I needed it for a project, I'd run to any store that had it and I'd run it and just make sure it had the right fiber content and twist that I was expecting. So if it was the right weight and the right fiber content, I ran it. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Love the stuff from Madeira. That's my primary choice. Nothing wrong with that. I know there's lots of great threads out there. There's Exquisite and Mettler and you know, there's a million different threads that are out there that you can run. I will say this, learn the thread and learn how it runs for you and, and honestly run it. Run it and see how it works. Different threads run a little differently, but I'll say most polyesters and rayons work pretty similar. Lots of metallics are similar, though there's some standouts that work very well, especially some of the new coated metallics are awesome. But the thing is, running the thread will teach you what it can do, and listening to the manufacturers will help you there too. But yeah, like I said, uh, Anointed Songs says I'm in the home world. Home world's awesome. Home world is a big part of what I do too now. And it's I think that a lot of inspiration comes from the home world, but I'm still a commercial guy at heart, so I tell you a lot of the commercial stuff I know. Uh, it's just where I came from. I started out on 12-head machines, two of them. So you have to understand that's that's certainly where my background is. But I, I love working at home, too. And I have a little machine that I like to play with. So absolutely how it goes. And uh, yeah, it depends on where it is. Uh, Joanna says, major experience in the home world. Speed's not so much of an issue in that world because they're embroidered for pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Speed, no. I would say efficiency, avoiding breakage and jumps certainly still work worthwhile for sure. And yeah, Ramona says, software, people send thousands where they feel should be auto digitizing perfection. Um, auto digitizing is never perfection. Also, I think one of the big pitfalls is removing yourself from the process. And that's a good segue into what I'm going to talk about with pitfalls, folks. But yeah, we have a lot of stuff that we're talking about. But yeah, Pam says that I think I had the idea of how it's done and failed trying to make it happen in software. Yeah, absolutely. Need to learn more about software and how it operates. That's the way to do it. 
play with the software and see what the answers are as far as you make some choices, you see what it does on screen, copy that object, change some settings so the objects are left and right next to each other, change some settings and look at the difference between the literal stitches on screen because that's mostly what's going to output. It's the way to go. You'll find out what's going on between the two and you'll find out what changes in the settings, changes in your decisions, change about the stitches that are being output. It's how it is. But, and Lisa Shaw, who is obviously, she's standing on, on the uh, soapbox with me, I guess. <laughs> we may have never met, but we stand on the same soapbox together. Yes, keep you, the artist creator in the process and understand that you have creative control. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. Uh, but let's go ahead and get to the pitfalls. And that's going to be how we finish this up. I'm going to make the pitfalls a little shorter because hey, I don't like negativity. But there's there's some pitfalls that I think are useful. So let's talk about the pitfalls and just kind of give you the pitfalls that I think are still current, the ones that we talked about before, and then talk about them again. So because I made all my little branding, let's do it again. Pitfalls. What's going to cause you to have trouble? I didn't. I forgot to do the pillars one, guys. But here, pitfalls. Here's the pitfalls. Here are the things to avoid, right? So, what are we trying to avoid so we don't have problems, so that we don't uh, lose ourselves in it? And these are the ones that I originally started out with. Number one pitfall, I I think, and this is not maybe not the number one pitfall, but it's one that drives me nuts the most. It's the one that Lisa just talked about, and what we also saw from uh, Ram Ramona as well. Um, running on autopilot. I call it running on autopilot. What it means is expecting automation to do anything for you. The most egregious version of it, which is the version I always talked about before, was auto-digitizing. Um, it's not that there aren't places where automatic tools can help us, absolutely, but when it removes us from the creative process or stops us from making better choices for the design at hand, automated controls, auto-digitizing is a bad idea. And frankly, it usually doesn't do everything it needs to do as far as making the shapes we need to make good embroidery and to do things like balance for things like pull compensation and pull uh, push compensation. So pull and push distortion, the natural forces that are on all embroidery, whatever you do, there is always going to be some force on a, a stitch under tension. So running on autopilot to me means trusting too much in auto digitizing to give you a result that's like what you expect from a digitizer. Most of the problem isn't necessarily that you can't make something with an automated tool. It's that people expect to get the kind of quality that a digitizer puts in when they individually draw pieces. So imagine that I have a wing of a bird. It's one of the examples that I put on the earlier videos. If I have a bird's wing and it's got all these little feathers and details on it, and I splat that thing with auto digitizing and it makes it all one big uh, you know, set of stitches, maybe with a little bit of carving in it or something for texture, the difference between that and someone who has digitized individual feather clusters or, or has changed stitch directions and types to pr produce some roughness in one area and smoothness on the flight feathers, those two results are going to be very different. Can someone accept an automated version, a single fill that is splatted over a large object? You can. If that's the look that you're happy with, that's fine. My problem is most people want the look of digitizing where we draw the shapes we need, not the shapes that are shown to us in the art, the shapes that are necessary for our embroidery, the individual columns of satin stitch that we need to re represent the feathers that are in that bird's wing. When we draw those shapes, we get the ability to change stitch type, to change stitch angle, and to change um, different settings, different parameters about those stitch types on each object. If we use automation, it may take that away from us and make one big gray wing into a big gray slab of stitches. Is that okay for some people? Maybe. The problem I see is mostly that new people will come in with the expectation of artistic digitizing with the input of automation. There are automations that are fantastic. Uh, one I mentioned earlier, uh, we have an amazing uh, product in Merrily. They can make patches from any design with two clicks and they work very well. They are functional. They work very well. I like to have more control. I probably would go into Stitch Artist and make my own stuff, edit the shapes and stuff. That's what I do. But the thing is, that automation doesn't take away creativity. It adds an edge. It's functional. The automation that takes away creative choice is the automation that hurts us. So running on autopilot, not great. The other version is the one I talked about earlier. Somebody will have an applique tool and they will say, all right, I clicked the applique tool and it puts all the pieces there, but I want to resequence it and I can't figure it out. And I'm like, this is where we have to realize that just because we have a one click tool doesn't mean that we can't do things like resequence after the fact, make multiple copies of a certain object so we can separate out different steps, even in an automated tool that does a multi-step process like applique. We can put our own control into it 
even when there is a setting that is there to help us do everything all at once. It's great to have automation that does that. When we want to do something simple, like throw a patch underneath an entire design, we don't care about anything else about it, we can do an automated thing or, or a knockdown stitch like we have an enthusiast where we just want to have a big global underlay that's under everything with the same settings. A two-click option is awesome. For appliques or patch edges where we want to do different layering or we want to have only a piece of a border on an applique because we're overlaying two applique pieces together, rather than just copy a, a shape over and splat it and expect one step to do everything, we have to understand that if we want to go more complicated than that, there's a chance we're going to have to have some input into it. Or like I said, the one, the classic version where we're just expecting some sort of auto digitizing to make everything look like something that someone else sweated over and had to do all of this different you know, work towards drawing individual shapes and dealing with compensations and artistic choices, then we're, we're working with expectations that aren't really working well. Probably the top pitfall though is something I should have put first, but it's just, the for, this one was the one that drove me nuts because everybody getting in thought, can't I click a button and make it work? Not the way you expect. Maybe you can get something to work. Maybe you can get something even useful. But is it going to be the same as what we get out of real work? No. Uh, the second one that is massive is trusting the screen. I say this over and over again. You've heard it from me if you've seen me teach anything. The screen is lying to you. Trusting the screen will result in problems. If it looks perfect on screen, it will be distorted on the machine. If you distort it the way you should to deal with these stresses of embroidery on screen, it will look perfect on the machine when it runs because we know that forces are going to apply to it. So trusting the screen, and I think that actually applies to things beyond things like pull and push compensation. Sometimes people trust the screen for things like colors, and that's the thing that kind of blew me away because I came up in an era of embroidery machines that didn't have displays on them. They had either LEDs or color, color uh, setups that were on um, character displays. So L just LCD character displays that all they had were running numbers and letter codes to tell you what was going on. I came up that way. What, the, what thread color was going to go on each color stop? The one that I put on the needle and assigned to it. I never worried about what was going to be going on with color on a screen. These days we have the ability to preview things on the screen. So I'm not a Luddite. I'm not somebody who doesn't think that that shouldn't be important. Using the file formats that have colors embedded in them is great, but never forget that what ultimately is going to happen with embroidery is thread. The produce of a digitizer is embroidery, not a file, meaning nothing necessarily matters that much until the needle starts to go through the garment and thread is carried through the hole. Like that's where the things happen. It, it, the rubber meets the road for us is the needle dropping stitches through the garment. That's where it starts to come together. And for me, I don't, I never worried about color in that way, even when I started to have machines that had displays on them. Because trusting the screen in any format, first in digitizing where we're drawing perfect circles and not realizing that push and pull distortion are going to make them get narrower and longer. We're going to make ovals if we draw perfect circles. The other thing that we're going to end up with when we're trusting the screen is we're going to not see certain things about texture. We're not going to see that a line run over multiple times is going to get thicker. We have to understand the translation between the screen and the material reality. So trusting the screen and also not just trusting the screen, obsessing over the screen is not healthy for us. We should be obsessing over the actual stitches. We should be watching those carefully. The screen is just a preview mode that is useful to us to help us do our work. The actual result happens on the machine. And until we get there, the screen is somewhat immaterial. It is an assist for us to help us see where things are and how they're coming together before we get to the machine, which is where everything's actually proven out. So people do get hung up on that screen or they haven't tested something ever and they're worried about what they think is happening on screen that isn't going to really happen in the final piece. And sometimes they need to get past the screen. But mostly this has to do, the old school version of this has to do with making shapes that don't actually work for the real embroidery because they don't know the difference between what's going to happen on screen versus what's happening on the actual machine and the forces that are involved. It goes back to our pillars. Uh, the next one, the next big pitfall I see is people losing what I call stitch consciousness especially if you're someone who's designed for other media that don't have the same limitations. It's where you don't think about how many stitches you're jamming into a small area. That's one part of it. 
or where you just use too many stitches to get to coverage. You're trying desperately to make sure you have color coverage, so you just slam a tremendous amount of density into a filled area in order to make sure it's got coverage without thinking about the fact that, yes, we tighter stitches mean coverage, but it also means more penetration points along the edges. It means more three-dimensional density. It means punching more th literal thread through a garment through stabilizer, which is more bulk, more weight, and more distortion. They forget that stitches are a real physical object. They forget that thread is a thing that is under tension. They forget that it abrades when it's in tight areas smashed together. They forget that they're jamming a needle through a real garment and that there are textures and other sorts of forces involved in the process. When you lose stitch consciousness, it means you, number one, it often means people use too many stitches to get the job done so that their designs are too dense and they feel like a credit card that's taped to the front of your garment rather than like a loose design that's sewn through it. You want something that has a little bit more flow, a little nicer hand when you can get it. And, and or <laughs> they will just not really think about stitches or thread as a physical object, or they won't think of the effect that the garment has when we're really stitching through it. So losing the consciousness of what a stitch is and what we're actually doing, which is driving a needle with thread in it through a garment, will cause you to forget things that are important. And it comes into the next kind of uh, pitfall that we have, which is what I call micromanagement, which is working at an incredible zoom rate constantly without zooming out to the one-to-one uh, -one size. And like I said, calibrate your screen. So when you, when you zoom out to one-to-one -one size, it's the closest it can be to actual size on your garment. They zoom into a tight detailed area and then draw every little line. Uh, the way I usually describe it is they're trying to draw a tree by drawing every leaf and sometimes every vein on every leaf without thinking about how thick thread is and how much they're jamming into one small space. So micromanagement can be that we're working at incredibly small zoom rates and working at that small scale, not realizing how short our stitches are or that we're packing in too much detail. So packing in too much detail, working at a high zoom, uh, you can get yourself obsessed in the detail and sometimes the very meditative state we get into when we're flowing through, dropping all of our points and drawing things, especially on an engraving style design, can lull us into this concept that we need to represent every single line or dot or element that we see when really what we need to do is look at the embroidery at the size it's going to be, be aware of our scale, and put in as much detail as will fit. Because what do we know, right? Density is a description of how close together rows of stitching are. More density, less density. That's what that is. That's all density is. If we draw in our own details and they get to a level where they achieve full density, we can create our own fills and we can block anything that's behind it. And now we have a glob of a single color, not individual lines or details. Eyes on small people is where I see this the most often. Little tiny knots because people try and put all the detail in the eye because the eye is important for us to understand people. We put all the detail in it at much too small a size and we cause thread breaks and other problems. So last one on this one that absolutely gets you, uh, testing unscientifically. And I actually kind of put this into something that I called an updated version, which is magical thinking. But let's take it back to testing unscientifically, uh, where instead of testing each thing that we could change about our design or testing one thing that we think might be at, at issue, let's say we have an outline that's not lining up Somebody goes and goes, all right, well, I'm increasing my pull compensation. I'm changing a stitch type here. I'm stretching the hoop tighter. I'm going to add three layers of stabilizer, and I'm going to slow the machine down by 200 stitches a minute. And then they start running it again. And let's say that it does work. Let's say all of this stuff comes together, and now their outline is where it's supposed to be. And now the outline hits exactly how it should. Because they didn't isolate what they were changing or change one thing that they thought that was the best chance of being the problem, they now don't know which or how much of these changes you know, led to the final result that they wanted. When you test unscientifically, when you don't isolate one thing to check at a time or don't stop at least to think about what's the most likely cause of this problem or that you could probably correct with any one of these things, potentially you could correct the design problem with the the outcome problem with any one of these changes but we've made a bunch of different changes that may or may not have actually helped anything and where i often see this is something like somebody makes changes to the digitizing but then they go and add a bunch of stabilizer and now i don't know whether the stabilizer is just holding an otherwise stretchy garment in place long enough for those stitches to hit where they should or the change in uh, distance or pull compensation or push compensation whatever it is that caused the problem actually hit it correctly. 
change one thing at a time as much as you can and think about what the best case is for making that change. If we have the right stabilizer for the right garment and it's all in place, the chances are we might want to make that change in the file rather than trying to add a bunch of stabilizers that's going to affect the quality of our garment. Any one of these things might change our ability to get things run or the, the machine speed. You might be running, you know, hellbent for leather and you might need to turn it down a little bit because we're running so fast that we're not allowing each stitch to relax. We're not allowing the material to relax back in place before we're dropping that needle again. And depending on your machine, it might not run that well at that speed, depending on what you're running. All of these could have something to do with it, but if we change a bunch of stuff all at the same time or don't really know what we're changing to start throwing everything at the wall, we might end up adding a lot of bulk to our design with excess stabilizer. We might end up with a design that runs okay on this one garment, but then we did a bunch of changes to it. We run it again and it doesn't work anywhere else because we made crazy, you know, crazy changes to it because we weren't hooped correctly, whatever it is. There's a number of things that we could have done where we're adding all these things together and we might only need to do one, or we might have changed the wrong one. Changed something that, yeah, it might stabilize things to add a load of stabilizer or slow things down to a crawl, but it would be a better choice for us, especially if we're going to run this design multiple times over its lifetime, to instead of just trying to put a Band-Aid on it, fix the thing that makes the most sense, like do our compensations correctly so we can still run at that same pace that's normal for our machine and still use the amount of stabilizer that's comfortable for somebody to wear rather than slapping a bunch of stabilizer on until it holds up. So testing unscientifically is one of those other pitfalls from the original set. But I do have a few updated pitfalls, the ones that I think have kind of come up in my last couple of years of work that I see more and more often that I find have really stopped people from making progress. Uh, and top one here, uh, taking out the trials. A lot of people don't want to do their stitch outs. They don't want to do trial work or stitch their designs out because they feel like it's a waste or it's a waste of time. But the learning that they lose is immense. Uh, so they want solutions before they ever get things on a machine and they don't want to waste materials. And I understand that materials can sometimes be costly. It's one of the reasons I advocate for things like saving every damaged garment you have so you can use that material when it comes back up later. That type of material in that colorway is always good to test on later. Or going out to thrift stores and purchasing cheap or damaged garments that have the right kind of material for garments you're likely going to run so you can do test sew outs. Um, test stitching is absolutely critical to understanding what's going on and is one of the most useful tools we have in our arsenal for learning. So taking out the trials, not being willing to test things or even do what I call test swatches or drill tests where we test out a swatch of stitching that has the settings that we want or multiple swatches in a small area, a small hoop, so we can tell what the changes to our different settings or parameters look like or the drill tests where if we're having an issue with one part of a design or one type of stitch interaction we make a small version of some portion of that and test against it to see what changes we could make to make that work out um, those tests are really critical to learning and here's the fun thing about this if you do your trials early on in your work of learning when you are later on in your learning you won't need to do them as often because you'll have a good experience a set of understandings and experiences developed over time that allow you to make educated guesses. The more you avoid the trials and you luck out maybe every once in a while and make it run correctly, and you or you luck out, or you just make things run as it's running, you put Band-Aids on, you throw extra stabilizer on, you color it with markers, you do what you have to do for each piece, um, the less chance you have of eventually being able to do this stuff without the trial and error. Um, Overall, the trial and error is what's going to prove out your skills and make you have what you need. So yeah, taking out the trials is a big one. Uh, like I said earlier, magical thinking is another huge one. Just starting to do things that are unrelated to the problem that they have. Instead of having that eye for analysis we talked about earlier, the sense for analyzing, they're like, okay, uh, my edges look funny. All right, it's underlay, density, topping, blah. It's all this different stuff. And sometimes it's related to the problem, but many people will just say, uh, nope, it's it's stabilizer. And sometimes the problems that they're having could not come from stabilizer. You have to stop and think about what the thing you're changing does. Stabilizer makes material stable so that it doesn't stretch dimensionally in one direction any more than another. That's usually what stabilizer is for. There are other things stabilizer does, but that's really what it's for. Backing or stabilizer is to stabilize material to arrest it from stretching in a direction. That's the primary goal for stabilizer. There's all sorts of other things that stabilizer has no effect on. Or you're having looping, uh, massive looping your design, unless it's where we have a, a load of tiny detail and it's literally hanging up the thread or causing there some excess friction. Looping, generally not to do with your digitizing. 
yelling at a digitizer for looping that you're having is not a great plan. It's likely something to do with the thread path or something going on with tension on your machine or your bobbin like I talked about earlier. Magical thinking is thinking just like throwing a change at it, any change at it is the concept when you don't think about why things work or how they work. Uh, I see a lot of that. And that's also, the other thing I'll see is something very similar, ignoring the evidence. We are looking directly at a design with an alteration that's very obvious. And there are people who are just like, I wasn't told to do that by X person who's the expert, whether that's me or someone else, it does not matter. If we're looking at a design, we know how stitches work and we can see what's wrong. Ignoring that to do something someone told you, even though it doesn't make any sense, is probably a problem. It's a, it's a pitfall people fall into. Someone Because someone said so is not always the best reason, especially if it doesn't make sense. Even me. <laughs> if, the, if I told you to do something, but something else is happening on the machine that's not related to what I said, uh, by all means, don't ignore the evidence. Uh, think in a scientific way and don't just do the magical thinking version of things, even if I'm the one who said it. I'll go ahead and say that. All experts are not always telling you everything because they don't always know everything that you know about your own setup. They may not, or they may be missing something or something may not have been communicated correctly. So sometimes that can happen, especially in the groups. Uh, a couple of the things that I think are in the pitfall section, in the kind of updated pitfall section for me, uh, waiting for a stock solution. Like I said earlier, your tools can do more than you think they can. Waiting for a tool or a new material to do things when we have an understanding of the basic things that are available to us, you know, test your tools, test your software, learn the things you can do, and expand by using the stitches you have. If you have the top kind of four stitches, if you have manual, run, satin, and fill, you can make incredible numbers of other combinations out of them. And depending on what you're doing, as long as it's not about automation or making things fast, you can make just about every other stitch type. In fact, you can make every other stitch type out of manuals if you want to take the time. Um, sometimes a stock solution doesn't exist. Sometimes a stock design doesn't exist. And one of these things, especially with digitizers, I see people searching for fonts when they have three or four letters in a logo that they could digitize themselves if they took a few minutes. And they spend time just beating down the door looking for a font that is probably 12 column stitches they could have drawn by the time they wrote out the post about it. Learn to digitize some very basic lettering and you will love yourself for it down the road. Uh, waiting for a solution to show up magically for the thing that you're doing or looking for um, the work that being done ahead of time when the work that's actually in front of you isn't that great or isn't that hard to accomplish can absolutely hold you back and make you spend a lot more time in the search. The hunt for an easy way to do something is often much longer than learning to do something for yourself or to use your tools. That's just the truth. I'm not saying people here, I think you guys who have held on through almost an hour and a half of this stuff, you probably don't do this. But when I'm looking at the general populace, this is one that I see really frustrate people sometimes. They can't find a font or someone tells them the logo that you're looking at has hand lettering and there's differentiation between all those letters. It looks to me like it was done by hand and there won't be a font. And some people get very frustrated when they're looking at a few letters that they probably could have handled by drawing the individual satin stitches in the letters in the first place. So don't do that. You know, look for, don't wait for the stock solution. It's great when solutions are available. It's awesome when we get ways that save us time, but ultimately the tools that we have in every software package and on just about every machine are likely going to be able to do 90% of our embroidery without any sort of extra additions or any sort of extra, you know, faffing about to look for extra tools having that done first and, I, and like i said i've seen this with stock designs as well somebody will ask for a stock design that is outlandishly specific to a certain person that's a good time to either get the design made by someone or to make the design yourself looking for that design for hours and hours or looking for the font and i've been on the bad end of this myself so i can incriminate myself too looking for fonts for hours is often trumped by just drawing the letters yourself um, and that's absolutely a problem that i see more and more often Last couple things, um, like I said before, that's the same thing, expecting psychic tools, same thing like that. That's very much that kind of, uh, that kind of automation problem we saw, thought about earlier. Uh, one of the last ones though is failing the pre-flight check. Uh, just about any software when it outputs a machine file has a few last little things it does as far as filtering and stuff before we get that done, before we get it onto the machine. Check that file, look at your final file as you put it up it's worthwhile to do. Really, this goes into software operations. Some people will turn on or turn off certain filtering options or other things about their software, or they will open soft uh, or open a design in software that processes 
the design automatically into objects. And then when they save it back down out of that software, the new objects have settings that don't match the original digitizer setup. And then they're very unhappy with the result they get. And the problem is they kind of failed the pre-flight check. And for me, what the pre-flight check is, I want to look at a design without changing anything. And I want to look at how it's going to run. And this also means in my own digitized designs, when I save the final version, I reopen the machine file and take a look at it to make sure everything is where I expect it to be. Color stops are how they're expected to be. Uh, trims are in the place I expect them to be. I do a pre-flight check before I run stuff on the machine because I could have of my own <laughs> accidental you know, setup problems or of my own volition, I could have set something up for an earlier job where I'm using a filter or a setting that I don't intend for the current job and I could have forgotten. It's a normal thing to have happen. Or if you're using the kind of software that process things into objects and you didn't notice that when you opened it, you could have inadvertently changed textures, changed stitch settings to something that's part of the analysis the software did when it was trying to give you a rejuvenated working file for you to be able to edit things on. So check the pre-flight, you know, make sure you're using the design as it was intended, especially when you're getting something from a digitizer before you run it, take a look. And honestly, you can move things over by themselves. Or when you check things out, just make sure that what you've done makes sense and what the design is what you expect it to do, be, right? Also, the pre-flight check is a last chance to make sure you haven't made another error. Uh, one of the pitfalls that Brian Bailey put on here that he actually absolutely I agree with is something that I see with digitizers all the time. And I'm going to scroll back and grab his comment if I can. Um, is copy and paste errors. Uh, and I am somebody who's done this many times because I tell you guys, especially when you're doing text, long strings of text, that it's a good idea to copy the same letter over and over and reuse it so that you have internal consistency throughout multiple lines of text if you're doing custom texts. Uh, if you mess up and accidentally copy and paste in place on top of itself, that's not always visible. So let's say I'm trying to take an E from over here and put it into another word over here. I accidentally paste a copy of the E on top of itself here, and then I paste the second version over here. I can end up where I'm running something twice, and it looks thick and bulky, and it might cause thread breakage. And that's something where I've just accidentally pasted something and you won't necessarily see it on screen because you can't see additional thickness. If you paste stitches right on top of the same stitches exactly where they are in the earlier copy, they won't show you that. There's no way to notate that on a two-dimensional screen that, yup, I've got two copies that's sitting on top of each other unless we look at the sequence or we do that pre-flight check, which includes running through the design with a slow replay once before we get going. So don't fail the pre-flight check. Check things at the last moment before you send them off. Watch the machine file run in software, not just the working file. Like grab your machine file, open it up, make sure it looks the way you intend it to. Especially if you're somebody like me, who I used to be on those, you know, couple of 12 head machines getting ready to rock. Now I was always running one sample first. Just gonna let you know, always running a sample on the single head first. But if I was making a change and doing an output for a 12 head machine, you better believe before I run 12 heads that I'm gonna run my way through that design on slow replay one more time. I'm going to watch a preview run in software to make absolutely sure that I don't have a copy paste error, that I don't have a, a trim where it doesn't belong, that I haven't done something out of sequence by accident moving things around. That, that pre-flight is absolutely going to save you a ton of trouble. All right, folks. So with that, I think we are way past bonus time. I think all of that makes sense to, to uh, kind of this whole milieu, this whole part put together. If we kind of have this all a synergy between the pitfalls and the pillars, I think we actually come together on some things that are common to all of them. So yes, indeed, there are pillars. There are things that hold us up that are the basic foundational understanding of what we need to do. There are pitfalls that can tear us down, that can cause us to mess up, that can cause us to arrest our own ability to progress in our digitizing. However, there are things that are common to all of them. And I think if we think about it, it really is about observation and experience of embroidery. So looking at seeing embroidery for what it is, understanding the way that fabric is constructed and how embroidery acts on it, but really observing how embroidery runs. That also takes place when we're talking about analysis of designs, we're talking about how those things run, but watching embroidery, paying attention to what it does on the machine and how the machine is working, paying attention to how changes we make in our software affect the outcomes on the embroidery machine. So a lot of this is observation and curiosity, careful observation and notation, and then testing in a way that makes sense kind of scientifically, testing in a way where we take that observation and apply it carefully and see where we are. 
I think that's what makes this possible. We take in information, whether this is from our groups, from materials, from documentation, wherever we take that from, then we apply it, and then we review what we've learned from that. So watch other people's designs run on screen and on the machine. Try your own designs, make changes, see how that makes changes on screen, see how it makes changes on the machine, and maintain your curiosity and your careful observation, and I think you're going to get there. Anyone here who wants to digitize will be able to. It might be harder or easier for certain people. You might have certain things you're naturally more, uh, have more of an affinity toward. But anyone here who wants to digitize will be able to. If we pay attention, we stay careful, we stay observant, we stay curious. And if we put things into practice and let ourselves have the space for trial and error and realize that those mistakes are not failures so long as we learn from them and use them, apply them to do the work we want to do. So for the last couple of things, just want to go ahead and uh, let people understand that, you know what, you are not alone in making mistakes. If I am to be your patron saint of lost embroidery, as I often am, understand that I have probably messed up more things than you have ever messed up in your life because I spent most of my time embroidering uh, in my life. So honestly, if you're, especially if you're just starting or if you're someone doing this for a hobby, uh, from someone who made thousands and thousands of pieces, trust me, I've made more mistakes than you probably have. If you can listen to me, then trust me, you're doing fine. <laughs> I've learned some things along the way and you will too. And honestly, let yourself have that space, but maintain that curiosity and watch carefully. Watch carefully with curiosity. You're going to get it. So last couple of comments here for sure. As Joanne said, I said 100 times, it's always best to test. Absolutely do some testing. Thank you guys for being here. And like I said, uh, you know, it really is about giving yourself the space to test, having that curiosity, watching carefully, and taking in some embroidery. Watch people's embroidery, look at different samples online, and stay curious about what thread can do. All right, folks, with that, can't wait to see you again and to talk more about this stuff next week.